Any questions? Yeah. The, um, yeah. Uh, Poisson ratio that you said that's only like equal to like point three around that area. Give or take a little bit. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. If you look in the in the back of the book, that's just what's shown. Okay. Also, of course, notice that for SI and English units, there is no difference because there is really no units left for strain anyway, and this is strain divided by strain. In fact, that's where we're, we're picking up then again right now. Um, with Poisson's ratio, we had just defined that on, uh, on Tuesday. What was the symbol for it? Kind of. I think. I think it's. Uh, no, it's probably not new. It's. Uh, if I remember now, new is like that. So it's well, whatever it is. It's boo. That's what it is. It's boo. Defined as. Ruby, you got it. You're looking at it. Lateral strain over axial strain. Lateral strain. Uh, if we give some definition to it uh, in terms of direction, we had a, uh, a simple parallel pipe that we looked at. And if we just give it some axial direction, that was the direction of the force being applied. It uh, can be, again, tension or compression. And then uh, the transverse directions. Um, might even be easier if we do it more like this. If we look at uh, a cylindrical solid that is stressed. In fact, we did this problem and then when it elongates now we have an axial stress sorry strain defined in the usual way and then a transverse strain would lay all in some uh, so this would be maybe del x, this is length x, this then would be del in the radial direction and that just emphasizes the way we're looking at most of our materials that there is no preferred orientation uh, for, for the radial direction. This implies that maybe the strain in the y direction is different than that in the x direction. Uh, sorry, the strain in the y direction might be different than that strain in the z direction, which could be the case. There are materials where there would, we would need to define a Poisson's ratio for the y direction that would be different than that for the z direction. We're not going to look at those materials. That's for advanced mechanics and materials um, and beyond what we want to work with. So maybe if we just put this as a strain in the radial direction, then it reminds us that it doesn't matter what that radial direction is. It could be in any direction around there. A, a little different than might be applied implied here. We were going to say for our class that any strain in the y direction is the same as the strain in the z direction. Um, remember what I called a solid that does such a thing? Isotropic. Ice, ice, isotropic. Um, most of our materials uh, will uh, will be such. Um, Wood is, wood is the big material that we're familiar with where there might be preferred directions. Especially since, uh, if any of you buy lumber, and you know the growth rings, 
if you buy lumber, you can buy it taken from a particular part of the wood. You might hear of quarter sawn lumber and that type of thing, uh, because wood taken from one section is going to be different than wood taken from a different section, because it does have directional properties there. It's especially true in wood if you look down the length of it. Uh, it's very rare that wood is cut such that the grain goes across the piece because then it's very weak for its usual purpose, which is as a structural material. The grain in wood is almost always run down the piece. And the purpose of plywood is to even overcome that directional um, bias. Plywood is different layers with the grain running in one way in a very thin sheet. Then another sheet is glued over it that has the grain running in a different way. And then another sheet is glued over and they can put even other directions. And you do multiple layers of that in plywood with all those grain layers in different directions, then plywood, it really doesn't matter what direction you lay the piece in to um, its purpose, it's, it's, it, when, it, when you install it, because it's got no, uh, no directional bias to it because of the grain of the wood. Um, so we're gonna look at, at uh, isotropic materials ones that have uh, uh, no particular directional bias. If you get into this uh, in advanced studies, and even you, know, uh, you can imagine the things that are now done with carbon fiber, where laying down the fabric in the particular directions greatly enhances the ability of the structure to absorb particular stresses. Uh, a great example of that nowadays is, is in bicycles where uh, almost all the high-end bicycles now are carbon fiber with the, the bias of the fiber fabric itself laid down in particular ways in particular parts of the bicycle to absorb the different strains and stresses um, and all the different types of uses of the bicycle. So uh, we'll uh, revisit right here just to kind of get us going again a problem we did look at, uh, I believe last week, it was just like this, uh, this um, cylindrical piece here. I'll even give you the same numbers. We're just going to take it a little bit farther. The original length was 500 millimeters and a diameter of 16 millimeters. Everybody will know what OD means. Uh, what? Not what it means up there. Outside diameter. Uh, that's that's not a concern with a solid cylindrical piece like we have here because there is no inside diameter. But very shortly we're going to be looking at tubular materials and we'll have an outside and an inside diameter and they'll be, it'll be important to us which is which. And then we put that under some kind of axial load and it caused it to, of course that's greatly exaggerated, caused it to um, react in that way. And we had a an axial elongation of three hundred micrometers, and a radial change of minus two point four micrometers. So we did this very problem uh, last week. You pull out your notes or, or uh, boot up your laptop and pull down that video. Except I don't remember which day it was. 
Uh, we did this very problem and actually came up with these different stresses in the different directions. Sorry, there's different strains. So you can either thumb back and find that or calculate it in about uh, three seconds anyway. But from this, we can get two other things now that we didn't have before. So now we can find Poisson's ratio. And we can even determine what Young's modulus is from this test. So do both of those. Get you kind of warmed up here, because man, we got a, a killer problem coming up. It's going to set you back a couple hours. The intensity of it. Bob's question is, what's the micro stand for? Help them out. Ten to the negative six. The way I remember that, Bob, is that if I see a micro, I remember it means 10 to the minus 6. That's how I remember it. Just as a, just as a little help to you there. What, not a moon? Go to the library. Yeah, because a lot of times somebody will get up and go to the bathroom and leave the calculator sitting there and then you can just take it. Oh, I don't condone that. <laughs> they, it, do you have one just didn't bring it? Yeah, no, it's all right. My dad's in the moments. Yeah, no good there, is it? Oh, by the way, I think we have a test coming up next week. First exam for, yeah, Tuesday for these first three chapters. So it'll be up through um, Poisson's ratio. I don't think we'll come across much new on Monday. Um, for you new guys, my tests are open book, open notes. Um, since it's only a one hour class, sometimes it's tough to, to give you enough time. So what I will typically do, does anybody have a class right after this? Because what I've done before when somebody did, when we only had one hour, but then there was a test after this, I'd give usually two in-class problems and a, a take-home problem to do. Um, would you rather just sit and work for a little extra time on Tuesday or have two in-class and one take-home? Take-home. There's one vote take-home. I think you said in-class. You go what you just threaten him? Do you want to? <laughs> so you saying uh, you saying glass, you say take home. Preference? Two in glass? Three in glass? Four in glass? Wishy washy. Four actually the wishy washy came cloak. Wishy washy was a stronger vote voting block than and viewers. All right, so we'll do we'll do in class. It it uh, uh, by by that I mean maybe 20 minutes extra. I wouldn't. I would hope you you wouldn't need more than that. Right? But I'm not trying to trick you on that. He's just trying to see if you know the basics of what we're doing so we can keep going. What what comes up next uh, depends, of course, on a lot of this stuff. So I wonder we've been going over it. All right, you had those from last week, I hope. If not, they're pretty easy to come up with again. I think TJ, you were the only one who wasn't here. What we get for the axial is just the 300 micrometers divided by the original length. Got to watch your units a little bit. That original length 
Yeah, it was millimeters. I can't remember what units specifically we used on that problem last week. Remember, there were thousands of choices. 600 micros is left okay. Uh, I think even radians is tacked on to some of those sometimes. I don't know how much sense that makes. It's not an angular measurement. Um, lots of different choices. And for the radial strain, the, uh, the change over the original dimension. Right, this is exactly as we had last week. So just to put them there in the same same units. Anybody get something different than that? Usually uh, what I'll well, what I'll probably do on a test if you have to come up with these, which you could expect it might be likely, I'll give you particular units for two reasons. One is just to make sure you can handle the conversions because there's a lot of different possibilities here. And uh, when you get to working in some place, if you're working in this, they're not going to ask you to give it to to do it in any units you feel like, you're going to have to give it to the units that are standard in whatever company you're working in. That way, when you communicate with somebody else, they all you all agree on what you're talking about. Uh, also, makes it a little easier for me to grade, and we're we're always interested in something that makes things easier for me. All right. All right. Anybody have Poisson's ratio? Point who? Point two five. Right in the order of what we're looking for. The main thing you have to do is watch your units. If they're the same top and bottom, then there's no worry. Oh uh, wait, isn't it minus point two five? That's why we have the absolute, absolute value here on the, on the term. Remember, get in the habit of putting a zero in front of your decimal place. It's just the professional way this is done. I won't take off for it. Um, it's just uh, it's one of those little things I try to give you to keep your... To, to your there's, there's just a lot of little tricks and traps and pitfalls that can happen to you as a working engineer. And I'm hoping you're going to avoid some of them. That's one of them. Get in the habit of putting in that uh, that lead zero. Uh, wouldn't be a trouble here because uh, anybody working with this would know that uh, a Poisson's ratio of 25 doesn't make any sense. You'd figure it was 0.25. But get in the habit of doing that itself anyway. Anybody find... Young's modulus. If so, how? Do what? You're given enough to find the stress, and we've already just got the strength. So the stress would be, well, I, I gave you, yeah, I didn't write it up here, but it did give you that load uh, on the previous previous problem a couple weeks ago, or two weeks ago, I guess, one week ago, maybe, whenever we did this problem. But we've got all those pieces now determine Young's modulus. 
Um, this kind of thing could be used, I guess, as, uh, as uh, an aid in trying to identify an unknown material. So I don't know how often this type of thing is done forensically. Give it to me, if you would, please, in units of gigapascals. Bad, you don't have a calculator either? No, oh, not that, sorry. <laughs> kind of, you guys, you should have a, a leather, you know, a holster for it. I mean, you're engineering students. We used to have to carry slide rules like that. We could handle it. Wimp out, say, oh, it's at home on my desk. You didn't forget your half gallon of blue drink. So I got that for you. Okay. DJ's got both calculator and his morning drink. There's no try. Doobie's got calculator and two morning drinks. So I don't know what it is, but there's something about this side of the room over here. joys of circular calculators because they can be made pocket size and you don't have to run out the end of the slide rule and change the calculator. Well, you don't even know what I'm talking about. So. Slide rule can be great. It's one of those skills that all the old engineers will say, oh, kids these days, they should have done it the way we did. Got it? Who'd you check with? No one. I may remember my drink and calculator, but I'm not going to talk to anybody. Get it? No, you didn't get it. You don't have a calculator. Pat, I don't have a calculator. I do have slide rule in my office. Would that help? Did you work it? Yeah. Actually, I've got uh, my grandfather. Um, in order to increase the uh, significant figures, the only thing you could do is just make slide rules bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've got my grandfather's was about this long and had a magnifying glass over the hairline so he could read it even more, even more precisely add more significant figures to it. So, you're welcome then. You're welcome. Well, uh, you guys have calculated it's not long. Go get the show. What do you got? 
You got a calculator. What'd you get? I got nine, in gigapascals. What you meant was a hundred? Yeah. You didn't get that. You got something different. Yeah, that's what I got, actually. <laughs> Tell me what you get. I got the 99, but I'm not sure. All right, let's check. Let's check. Did you do the stress separately? Yeah. P's no trouble other than it's kilonewtons. Area. Area is sometimes trouble here. For students, what do you use for area? Pi r squared, I hope. But we've got, remember, um, the original diameter. So it's pi over 4 d squared. Changing it to meters as we go. So we're automatically in Pascal's that way. Remember, Pascal is a Newton per meter squared. Those numbers look okay? Yeah. Beach? All right? Yeah. Yeah? What'd that come out to be? I do know. Huh? I got eight. I got four. Frank, did you did you break the stress out separately? You don't have to. Certainly, you can put the values into here. It's just sometimes it just uh, it, it works better going from a larger problem to two smaller ones. Is all. Four nine. Point four nine. One point four nine. A couple scowls over here, including from me. Juvie, you got what? 59.68 times 10 to the negative 6. That's what I got. 59.7 and then what? Times 10 to the negative 6. Positive 6. We had negative, a couple negative things on the bottom. And that's in pascals, so that's 59.7 megapascals. So this E, we now have 59.7 times 10 to the sixth pascals divided by the strain in the axial direction because we're looking at the axial stress, those have got to match. Um, 600 times 10 to the minus 6, because it was a, a micros. Those cancel then, the 10 to the 6 cancels the 10 to the minus 6. Yeah, I hope not. And then that gives you, oh, we'll just call that 60. So we have one tenth times 10 to the 12th pascals. What's a uh, what's a gigapascal? 10 to the ninth. So if we move this over one. Two, three. We'll have ten to the ninth pascals in, which is a gigapascal. So does that look about what you got? Not a lot of precision required in these numbers. So ninety-nine point nine seven is kind of a waste of effort and ink. Like remember, we're going to build a big factor of safety on there anyway, usually. Uh, if you were actually in the design of this. So uh, don't belabor the point with a lot of details, especially if you haven't. Uh, it's 
slide rule, which automatically takes care of significant figures as you go. You just can't read the crap off the screen you guys can read. Uh, to do that calculation, do you have to have the stress in micros? Because if you had it, it's just like no units, meters over meters, then it would be 600, right? So it mess it up? No. If you take off the micros, it's 600 times 10 to the minus 6 meters per meters or inches per inches. Okay. Or percent that messes up? Uh, yeah, if you don't change it back okay. to, to this. Percents, percent is kind of like a unit itself. If you put percent, if this value in the terms of percent, then you've got pascals per percent, okay. technically. So, uh, generally, I think on these things, if you uh, convert, convert down to the base unit as you go, you generally have a little bit less trouble. Uh, once down to the base units, take it all the way through, and then once back up to the requested units, you're generally okay. Or, if I don't specify, or you're, if you go to work in this field and it's not specified, you can leave it like this. It's not wrong. But, as you can see, we got a lot of uh, changing back and forth from very small to very big units. And uh, that's not going to change. There's times when we'll have very normal numbers, but there's going to be a lot of times when we're working with very small and very big units. Alright, so here's a nice new problem for you. Have a beam here of three meters in length. So we stencil right on the side of it how big it is there. Supported by two cylindrical posts. See that looks like grass, doesn't it? Too bad I don't have a green chalk. That would really help. Notice the two posts are not the same length. Slightly different lengths on those. Remember what uh, we're looking at lately has a lot to do with, uh, with that. Uh, 220 millimeters. This one's 210 millimeters in length. Exaggerated there, of course. He's drawing to, to scale. Both of them have the same diameter, 30 millimeters. Both support posts there made out of 2014 T6 aluminum. Start throwing numbers around like that. You know, you're in Starbucks or something. Just drop the, you've been working with some 24 jeans in it. Oh, the girls love it. Two of you are married, so it doesn't matter. Awesome stuff. See? Tubi's now thinking, God, I wish I was single, just to hear that kind of phrase. So, start drawing this stuff around. It's a big deal. All right, so, there we go. We'll label this one, this side over here, A, and that side, B. How's that work for, for the creative part of this class? A couple of you already checked. Is uh, 2014 T6 aluminum in there? So you might need some of those numbers. Otherwise, well, uh, maybe I'd throw that in as a red herring. It would have been a red herring in uh, statics when we didn't need that type of thing. But in this class, 
we're finally talking about real engineering materials and how we're going to use them. All right. An 80 kilonewton load is placed on there, perhaps a, a generator or an engine or something put there. at some unknown spot. Remember, for right now, we're not allowing our the beams in any of these problems to bend. They will shortly here in class, but for right now, consider that the beam AB itself is rigid. Once loaded like this, the beam, however, will displace down a little bit. I want you to find two things. Find X. Uh, you're going to need that anyway. I also want you to find the diameter of A after it's loaded, after the 80 kilonewtons is placed there, such that the beam remains horizontal. I don't want uh, either one to tip one way or the other. Remember, once this uh, is compressed, it's going to cause uh, the leg A to bulge out a little bit. We'll assume it's uniform along the length. Well, yeah, you're going to need delt because you'll add that on to the original diameter of 30 millimeters to get the loaded diameter. Find yeah, so you're going to have to find del. Where's that going to come from? Maybe we'll make out a, a little map for ourselves here. Uh, Got to find da. That's going to come from finding del, be in the radial direction. That can come from the strain in the radial direction. Where can that come from? It's Poisson's ratio. Where can that come from? The book. The book. Okay. Um, so. What, uh, will that be the, enough then? Can we just look up this and go from there and finish up? Well, yeah, what are you going to do with it though? That we want to pull this out of Poisson's ratio, we're going to need the strain in the other direction to pull this out. So we're going to need the strain in the x direction. Where's that going to come from? DJ, what would you say? No, why? Uh, yeah, if we know the strain in the, uh, or the, the change in length in the x direction, 
where will that come from? Won't that come from the requirement that this load be kept, or the beam be kept level? partial solution map, I guess. There's going to be some other parts, uh, especially in here. Jake, you were saying something about the elasticity. The elasticity and the stress are going to come into that. The stress is going to come from the load that that post is bearing, and that's going to come from static equilibrium. So, couldn't be any clearer than that then now. change your grade from last fall. 
and statics. You want me to do that? There's three unknowns, the two reactions and the placement of the load X. So you're going to need three equations. Not in any particular order, but you're going to need three to find the reactions. You need to find at least the reaction FA to find the stress in A, use that with the Young's modulus to find the strain, so what are the three equations? Even if you don't need to find all three, still need three equations to find the one we know, or the one we need. So what was one of the equations? Sure. The forces have got to sum to zero. the other two equations are. You're going to need this load FA and the placement to make sure that the beam stays level. So what are the three equations? One will be the sum of the moments about A. Sum, sum the moments. Yeah, if we sum the moments about B. We don't need B. We do need A. So that would certainly help, but what's the third equation? about B is summing the moments about A an independent equation. 
Remember, when you need three equations, they have to be independent equations. Is it independent to sum the moments about some other place on the same problem? That is. So, sum the moments about A, or sum them about P, or you can even do it about any other place. It doesn't matter. You just have to do it about some other place. A is, is just as easy as any. And you should be able then to find um, the load in FA, or the, uh, the reaction.